It's great to be back in Georgia. Thank you, Pata, for putting this together, and thank you uh, for organizing all of this. Um, you know, and, and, and thank you to the, to the many people who I've met over the years in, uh, in Georgia who are here today. You know, one of the engines of progress, one of the engines of the wealth that we all enjoy, and even in Georgia, we are all extraordinarily wealthy. I know it's hard to believe, but you guys are all rich when compared to any other period in human history. 300 years ago, 95% of humanity lived in what we consider extreme poverty, $2 a day or less. Try to imagine right now what it would mean to live on $2 a day or less. $2 in today's dollars. 300 years ago, everybody lived on that. Everybody survived on that. It was easy. They didn't have nice clothes. They didn't have any electronics, no iPhones. They didn't go out to eat. There was no such thing as restaurants, no movies. There was nothing. Life was short. What was life expectancy? Was 45. 45 if you were, yeah. Most places under 40. 39 in Western Europe. Rest of the world, life expectancy was 30. I mean, you guys are as young as you are. You're all middle age already. I'm dead a long time ago. That was life. And what did you do during the day? You got up in the morning when the sun came up. You went and worked through the field. And when the sun went down, you went home. You put out a fire. You ate a little bit. And you went to sleep. No books. Nobody could, people couldn't read. But there was no point. There was no time to read. No electricity. No light. No lanterns. Too expensive. Life was short and brutish. Most children died before the age of 10. And this is how human beings have lived for almost all of human history. So there's a famous graph. I'm going to draw it in the air. 10,000 years ago, we made, most people, 90 plus percent, made about $2 a day or less. And they kept making about $2 a day or less. A little bit better under Rome. We actually got some, some nice running water and things like that. But then, dark ages, everything goes back to $2 a day or less. And then one day, bam, we all got rich. So you can't really understand us getting rich without understanding finance, without understanding financial markets, how they evolved, and how they contribute to human well-being. Human beings are better, richer. We have more opportunities because of financial markets, financial institutions, finance in the broadest sense. So what I'm going to do right now is give you kind of a, an outline of the history. You know, we've got, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes. We can't go too deep. We can't give too many detail. But I'm going to give you an outline of the history of the way finance has evolved over the last, I always get too hot. All right, there goes the jacket. Over the last, really, 10,000 years or so. So when you think finance, what is the product of finance? Money. money, absolutely. It's all about money, right? Now, where did money come from? How did we get money? Trade. Money came from our need to trade. Why do we need to trade? Because the reality is that we can't produce everything that we need to live. There's just too many things for a comfortable life for us to be able to produce. I don't know how to, well, I, I actually don't know how to make an iPhone. I certainly don't know. In a modern day, I don't know how to make most of the things I use. I don't know how to make clothes. I don't know how to make shoes. I don't know how to grow, grow food. I don't know how that camera works. I don't know so many things. And the beauty of trade is, I don't need to know any of that. Because somebody specializes in cameras, and somebody specializes in iPhones, and somebody specializes in shoes. I specialize in this, 
and it's hard to believe, but I can make a living doing this, right? Make enough money so I can then trade with the guy who makes the iPhone and the guy who makes the shoes and the guy who makes the cameras and I can get all those things by doing what I am good at doing. I'm not good at these other things. Every one of us has something we're good at, something we love doing, something we can do to make a living so that we can trade, not buy, don't think of it as buy. You're trading for all the other things that you need. But before we had money, to do that trading was really, really difficult. Because if I had cows, but I wanted chickens and you had chickens, it was really difficult to trade a cow for chickens. Chickens are smaller. Like how many chickens is one cow worth? And you can't cut a cow up into pieces. It's not the same, right? To cut it up is dead. A dead cow is worth more or less probably than a live cow. So it's, it's very complicated to try. If I'm growing, if I grow tomatoes and I want a cow, how many tomatoes for a cow? A huge number of tomatoes, right? And the guy who has the cow has too many tomatoes now. What's he going to do with all these tomatoes? Use some of them to buy a chicken. It's just complicated. It really is. So that's called barter, right? When we trade goods for goods. So some genius, who knows when, 10,000, 15,000 years ago, at some point in human history, some genius thought, what if we created some other product, something that everybody wanted, or at least everybody valued somehow, and we could use that to exchange for everything else? And maybe the first thing that they used was maybe, I don't know, some rare bones of some animal that everybody thought was pretty. And then they use that to exchange. If you look at different cultures around the world, you find different things becoming money at different points in time, depending on what the culture valued. But over time, people kind of gravitated to using gold as money. Why gold? Because it's rare. Because it's shiny and pretty and we like to make jewelry from it, right? Every, who doesn't like gold? Everybody loves gold, right? And it's, you can break it up into units and you can measure it, right? So we can have a little bit of gold maybe for buying the tomato, a little bit more gold to buy a chicken, a, a big pot of gold you know, to buy a cow. But now we can break it up, like, right? And now it becomes, and gold became money. And suddenly the global economy was very local, but it, in a sense everywhere in the world where they used money, suddenly became more efficient. I didn't have to worry about cows versus tomatoes versus chickens versus this versus that. Everything is now denominated in ounces or some weight of gold, kilos of gold. Uh, right? And that increases efficiency. It encourages people now to specialize because they can trade for everything. They don't have to worry about the units of exchange and how to do the trading. Now a whole world opens up of all people specializing in their little different things, and we can trade among all of us. We don't have to worry about, how do I move my cow? How do I move my tomatoes? You know the other problem with tomatoes is? Is they rot. They get bad after a while. So if you're gonna trade tomatoes, you have to trade them quickly. But now I can trade them for gold. It's easy, I can trade to 10 different people. Each one can buy one tomato, and that's okay. But when I was bartering, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna get rid of these tomatoes? So money made the economy immediately much more efficient. And again, we don't know exactly when this happened. But one of the things people realized is that sometimes, sometimes I need more money than I have. And maybe I go to a, a, you know, the local farmer, maybe he has a little bit more money because he had a good harvest and he's sitting, and I say, you know, can you, can you give me some of your money? I need, I need to use it in order to buy some things, in order to live or maybe to invest in my farm. And he goes, why should I give you any money, right? What's in it for me? Okay. So, you know, maybe people scratch their heads for a while and figure out how do we make this work? Because sometimes I'm short of money, sometimes I have more money than I need. There should be some way to use this money more efficiently. So it's not just lying around because different people have different demands and different needs at different times. How about 
if I give you the money, but I charge you interest. When you return the money, you give me back a little bit more than before. Why? Because you're using my money for a while. Also, you might not give it back. So there's a little bit of a risk, right? So to compensate me for the risk of you not paying me back and to compensate me for the fact that I can't use the money while you have it, I want some interest. And slowly people starting lending each other money. I think this developed very early on where people lent each other money. But this is interesting because in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God tells the Jews in the Old Testament, he says, you're not allowed to charge interest from your brother. In other words, you're not allowed to give out loans and expect interest. So I'm supposed to give my money to somebody and just hope it comes back and not charge anything for the use and not charge anything for the risk. Yeah, God says, no interest from your brother, which is interesting. We'll get to why from your brother is important, because what God meant by brother, what the Jews interpreted meaning is from other Jews. But non-Jews were not brothers. So Jews could charge interest of everybody else, just not Jews. One of the reasons Jews became moneylenders later on. But when Christianity came about, the Christians said, huh, Everybody's my brother, right? Christianity is a universal religion. Jewish, the Jewish religion is a very closed religion. You, you can't become a member. It's a club, right? But Christianity, everybody can become a Christian. It's very easy to become a Christian, very hard to become Jewish. So the Christians said, well, if God doesn't allow me to lend money with interest to my brother, he doesn't allow me to lend with interest to anybody. And usury, which is interest, charging interest on a loan, became a mortal sin. You went to hell for doing it. Now, as you can imagine, this creates financial problems. Kings need to borrow money to go to wars. We talked about, somebody talked about Georgians liking uh, to go to the army, right? Wars were very popular, sadly, in human history, but you need money to go to war. And they often needed to borrow money. But Christians weren't allowed to lend. They weren't allowed to charge interest. And one of the reasons you saw Jews going into the sector of money lending and banking, ultimately what became banking, is because they were allowed. God allowed them to charge interest of non-Jews, not just from the old brother. And you can see how maybe Christians started hating Jews a little bit because of this. Right? I'm not allowed to lend you money. But the Jew is? What the hell? If, if usury, interest, is a mortal sin, shouldn't it be a mortal sin to him as well? Uh, you also see, you know, uh, once in a while, um, there's a famous story in York in England where, uh, you know, the local aristocrat borrowed a little bit too much money. Who knows what he spent it on? Maybe parties and other stuff, and he borrowed too much money. He couldn't pay the Jewish money lender back. So what do you do if you can't pay your money lender back? Got to be creative here. Well, you, you organize a pogrom. You organize the killing of the Jews, and you make sure that the moneylender is one of the Jews that gets killed. So some of the anti-Semitism and some of the murder of Jews throughout the centuries was a consequence of, we owed the money. Let's get rid of the books. We burn the books. We burn the moneylender, and it disappears. So, uh, unfortunately, this connection uh, ha has stayed, and a lot of anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism is associated with this idea of Jews, money, why can't we do it, they can do it, and all of that. Uh, there wasn't a lot of progress in finance after the fall of Rome during the, during the, uh, the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, partially, to a large extent, because of this prohibition on charging interest. It's, it's hard to develop a profession where that's the heart of it. That's the essential feature, borrowing and lending money, where suddenly it's prohibited. The Catholic Church made it a mortal sin. If you, if you look at Dante, Dante's Inferno. I, everybody, I don't know if you've read the book, but there's a, it's a famous uh, uh, Middle Ages book. Uh, the money lender is, got, is, is on the seventh rung of hell. He's got a bag of, of gold around his neck, and the gold 
is being drawn to the fire in the middle. So he is burning up. Right? This is not a pleasant image for people. This is not a noble, good, positive profession. And that was, it. That was the view that most of the Christian world held uh, during the Middle Ages. Even when you, when you, uh, when you see bankers like the, uh, the Medici bankers in Florence, you know the Medicis, the, the people who supported uh, Michelangelo and Raphael and, uh, and all the great artists during the Renaissance, they pretended they weren't charging interest. So they would make loans, and this, uh, by the way, still exists today in finance, Islamic bank banking, I don't know if you've ever heard of Islamic banking, but the way they do banking in the Middle East and the way it's called Islamic banking, and they, they're not allowed to charge interest either. Islam prohibits charging interest. So they give you a loan, and you're supposed to pay back plus interest, but they don't call it interest. It's now like you've like a dividend, or it's like you you own a piece of the company. It's all a lot of pretending. But the, all the pretending is geared towards not violating this law or this statement where you can't charge interest. They find all kinds of loopholes and all kinds of way around that. And, uh, you know, charging interest on loans was prohibited by the Catholic Church until the late 19th century. So these alternatives developed. And... You know, the Medicis were in Renaissance Italy. They started, you know, the economies of Europe started growing. What happens when the economies grow? What, what, is, what is required in order to grow an economy and employ people and start businesses? What do you need in order to do that? In most cases, just free will. Well, free will is the beginning. It's not enough, right? You have to convince somebody to give you what? Say it's a voice. Say it right now. Investments, maybe. What's that? Investments. Yeah, you need money. You need capital. So if you have an idea, like even today, it's the same thing today as it was back then. You have a great idea. You think you can change the world. You're going to invent some new, the best gadget ever, better than an iPhone, better than, okay, how do you actually make it a reality? You have to buy you know, you have to do the research, you have to write the program, you have to buy the equipment, you have to hire employees. How are you going to do all those things? Well, you need money. You need investors, or you need bankers, or you need a loan, but you have to have money. No business gets created without capital. Sometimes it's your own capital, sometimes your family gives you the money, but most of the time, the money comes from a bank or venture capitalist, or some investment bank, but some kind of investment has to come in. So as the economies of Europe were growing, more capital was needed, more businesses started being created. And people like the Medicis realized that there was this enormous opportunity. They started building branches of banks all over, all over the country. And making loans in gold. They were still using gold in those days. And they would move the gold from place to place, depending on where it was required, where there was more economic activity. And that's how the first kind of multinational banks were created. They were created during the Renaissance and in the following of the Renaissance. And even the Jewish money lenders got more sophisticated and started banks. And you see the Rothschilds, the famous Rothschilds, uh, building banks all over Europe that Lent money, borrowed money. The important thing to note here is, you know, Marx, Karl Marx, you've all heard of Karl Marx, you all know Karl Marx, right? Karl Marx teaches us something that I think has become embedded in our culture in a deep, deep way. Where does all value come from, according to Marx? What, what is, where do, where do products, where do goods, where, do, where, where does the stuff we use, who creates them, according to Marx? People. What kind of people? Workers. Workers. Everything is a consequence of manual labor. All creation is the creation of the workers you employ. How, how do we get an employee? How do we get an automobile? We get an automobile through the work of the workers who tighten the bolts, who, who put the car together, who assemble it. And therefore, everybody like managers and capitalists, because they don't actually build the car, what are they? 
ex exploiters. They're exploiting the workers because the workers build everything. But the reality is, the reality is that that's upside down. The reality is that there are no workers until there's an idea. Every business starts with an idea. Every business starts with an entrepreneur, with somebody who thinks they can do something better than it's being done before. No business ever starts with workers putting an automobile together. Somebody has to have an idea of an automobile. And groups of workers don't have those ideas. It takes an entrepreneur to have those ideas. And if you read the history of business, every single business starts with some entrepreneur. And then what does the entrepreneur have to do? He has to raise capital. Because you know what? No workers work for nothing, for free. So he pays their wages even when the company is losing money. If you think about today, in financial markets today, if I want to start a biotechnology company, I need to raise a lot of money because I have to hire scientists and they have to do research and that research can take years and years and years to do. Who's paying those researchers while this all happens? The investors. I am through the investors, right? And what's the chance that after all these research, we actually have a product that we can sell, that the regulators will approve and we can sell in the market and make a profit? It's very small. If you look at biotechnology, very few companies ever succeed. So somebody has put all their money at risk to pay employees for years and years and years salaries. None of them are doing it for free. They might get zero back. Usually they get zero back. Maybe they get, a, you know, if they're lucky, they get a lot back. But in the meantime, they paid out. So in a sense, isn't the employee quote, exploiting the capitalist. They're working, they're getting a salary. Capitalist is getting zero. It might, even if the capitalist gets a return, it might be 10 years in the future. Every startup loses money for the first few years. I don't know any business that doesn't lose money in the beginning. Who's bearing the risk and the cost of that? Not the employees, never the employees. It's always the capitalist. It's always the financier. And who decides which idea should get funding and which idea should not get funding? Because you know what? Some ideas are really, really stupid. I mean, they're bad ideas all the time. You know, I don't know if, how many of you are in crypto, but uh, there's a lot of bad ideas in crypto. You can see a lot of them collapsing right now, right? Over the last year, a lot of them. Maybe some of you owned them as they went to zero, um, right? But somebody has to decide when you come to an idea and say, I've got this idea of a new product, I'm going to make X. Somebody has to decide, this is worth it, this is not. Now, in centralized, you know, in a modern world, in centralized authorities, who gets to decide that? Governments get to decide it. But in a free market, bankers, financial markets, they decide, I'm supporting this, I'm not supporting that. They allocate capital. And what's the principle by which they're allocating the capital? Who they think will be successful and who they think will fail. So capital goes to the most productive, efficient place possible. And different parts of the financial markets take on different levels of risk. Some people like venture capitalists who invest in startups, in technology, in biotech, they take a lot of risk. You know, for every 10 investments a venture capitalist make, do you know how many generate zero return? 9%. Not nine, but probably six, seven. Yeah, 5% average. What's that? So like 5% average. 5% average go to zero? Yeah. Uh, no, there's 5% that succeed. 5% that succeed. Yeah. Yes, 5% succeed. Usually one out of 10, you know, Usually five, one out of 20 does really, really well. That's the 5%. A few do okay, and the rest do nothing. Zero, they lose it all. Most people don't have the stomach, don't have the courage to make those kind of investments. That would scare me. I only get 5% of, only 5% winners would be very scary for my money, right? 
So venture capitalists take the most risky investors. Banks, how, many, how often do bank loans go bankrupt? Very rare. Maybe only 5% go bankrupt. Most of them pay back. They take the least risky. So financial markets have devised themselves into different categories. So we went from no financial markets to very, very sophisticated financial markets today. And all of this has happened really in the last 300, 400 years, where we've created these networks, these sophisticated banking and investment banking and investment vehicles, venture capitalists of all different kinds, private equity, hedge funds. Anybody heard of hedge funds? We've got hedge funds that make investments. I mean, the financial market today is super sophisticated, all because the needs out there are so many and so diversified and so different, and it's all based on different levels of risk. And the way we evolved to where we are today, from a simple ban on usury, is that starting certainly in the 18th century and the 19th century, people came to the realization that, put aside what the Bible says, in order to be successful, in order to have growing economies, in order to make money and develop and get rich, we need financial markets. We need banks. We need to be able to lend and borrow money. We need to be able to charge what they called usury. And the prohibitions just went away. The Bible, in a sense, if you will, was rewritten. The Catholic Church reinterpreted it. All the religions, basically, except Islam, basically reinterpreted the old scriptures. And what you started to get is banks everywhere and Again, these different types of financial markets. One of the things that banks did early on and why we have today paper money. So uh, during the, uh, the, the 16th century, a lot of people would go to um, the blacksmith. You know what a blacksmith is? Somebody who, uh, who deals with metals, right? And they would say, could you keep my gold for me? Just save it. And, and the goldsmith would give them a little receipt saying, I have your gold. You know, if you, you this is a, you know, you can come and, 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 and take your gold out. And people had these pieces of paper with, with it, and they would go, huh, you know, I, I need to buy something. I could go and get my gold out and then pay the merchant. Why don't I take this piece of paper? Maybe if I give it to the merchant, he'll take it, give me what I want to buy, and then he can go to the bank and collect the money, collect the gold. That's how we got paper money, these IOUs became kind of means of exchange. They became much more convenient than dragging the gold with you and having these bags of gold and having to weigh them in different quantities. Now you got paper that represented gold and that you could be redeemed for gold anytime you went to the bank. And now these blacksmiths said, huh, maybe we can give them different denominations, money. Right, Ten, paper money, $10, $50, $100, $1. And then they said, maybe I can take all this gold that I've got in storage. People don't usually take it all out. And maybe I can take that and lend it out and start making loans. And now you got a modern bank, a modern bank that takes in deposits and issues out loans. And you start seeing that in the 16th, 17th century, and they start growing, but again, they really explode when the Industrial Revolution explodes, when economic growth is high, when demand for capital, demand for investment, demand for loans really expands. And then suddenly you have uh, you know, finance funding this growth, creating this growth, but also because of the demand for their services, Banks evolving and growing and becoming more substantial. Now they get involved in deal making, in mergers, in everything that a modern bank today does or modern financial institution. In the, um, in the 19th century, one of the things that was happening was if I wanted to start like a railroad or something, I need a lot of capital. So I would go to all the people I knew and get money from them and then I would issue them shares, a percentage ownership in my company. And then what would happen is people would own these shares, but they didn't like just a piece of paper. They wanted to be able to sell these pieces of paper and get money. So I used to go to a little coffee shop in uh, New York City. And this coffee shop was on a, a street called Wall Street. 
And they would go to this coffee shop and everybody who had the shares would be there. And if you wanted, everybody knew if you went to the coffee shop, you could probably sell the shares. Somebody would be there and maybe they would buy the shares from you. And there started to be a regular marketplace, if you will. I've got shares of the railroad. Anybody want to buy them? And people would bid on them and so on. And that slowly developed and became, what did it become? Stock a stock market. And that was, it was on Wall Street. So today when we think Wall Street, we associate it with stock market investment, banking. Today it's a big stock market exchange. The same thing was happening in Amsterdam. The same thing was happening in London. And these stock markets come around, which basically take an ownership stake that you have in a company, which now you can trade in exchange for money. You can get the money, you can buy stock in another company, you can diversify, you can buy stock in lots of different companies. Again, it all happened organically. It all happened out of a, out of a need of people to invest and people to raise money in order to, in order to uh, uh, create businesses. So financial markets have seen this massive evolution, I'd say primarily over the last uh, 200 years, just as all of the industrial revolution was happening, all of this wealth was being created. We saw this expansion and diversification of financial institutions and markets. I consider finance the lifeblood of capitalism. Capitalism cannot exist without this flow of capital that goes through our, think of it, if you want an analogy, you know, financial markets and financial institutions are like, our, are like our circulatory system. The blood, if you will, is money. The heart pumps it to different, so finance is really our heart. Pumping it to the right places, like you're running, where does all the blood go? To the muscles of your legs, right? The heart is pumping it, the heart pushes it, but it pushes it more to the legs than anywhere else because that's where it's needed. When you're sitting and doing a test, an exam, at school, hopefully, where does all the blood go? Brain. To the brain. Well, I hope so. Otherwise, you're not going to do well in the exam, right? Because you're spending a lot of energy thinking. Thinking, you'd be surprised how much thinking, it, 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 you know, spells out energy. You don't have to exercise. Just think, and you'll, and you'll get thin anyway because calories are burnt when you do a lot of thinking. So the blood is like the, 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 is like the money, is like the money. The circulatory system is like the financial markets. Wherever it's needed, that is where it goes. So for example, I'll give you one example and then I'll take questions. During the, during the 1980s in the United States, the United States was making a lot of stuff very inefficiently. There were these factories that were making um, steel uh, products, cables, wires, and it was very expensive because America is a high cost country. Labor is expensive. Real estate is expensive. Everything is expensive. And you had these factories that were losing money. The Japanese, much more efficient, much more productive, much cheaper. And all these factories were just sitting there producing stuff and making a loss. And one of the things financiers realized that, wait a minute, if we buy these factories and liquidate them, sell all their assets, and take that capital and invest it in something where you can make money, that would be really, really cool. And what you had in America in the 1980s is exactly that. There's, the, there's an area of the America in the middle called the Rust Belt today. It's where all these steel manufacturing was happening, and it was losing money. And capitalists, financiers went in, they bought it all up, they sold it, they shut it down, they fired the workers, they were demonized because of it. But where did all that capital go? All that capital from selling all these businesses, where did it go? What happened in the 1980s? Economic crisis. No, 1980s, there was actually economic boom. So where did all the capital go? But where did, it, where did the boom happen? I mean, you guys are too young to know what did happen in the 1980s. Uh, in different countries. In, in America. Let's just stick to America. Were... Silicon Valley. That's all you have to... You know what Silicon Valley is? Computers. 
Software, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Cisco, Sun Microsystems, a million little computer companies and software companies. This is a new industry. It suddenly came out of nowhere. And Intel, right, microprocessors. And where was all the, where did all the money come from? Where did all the capital come from? From all those companies that were shut down, that freed up all that capital, it went and it grew up in Silicon Valley. So in a sense, financial markets know when to shut things down, when things are not profitable and not worth investing in, and then where they are worth investing in. Where they're worth investing in in the 1980s was in the risk. And we all today benefit from that, why? Because every single one of you has, right now on you, at home, and probably several of the products that came out of Silicon Valley. Products that were created with the capital that was redistributed. But people don't get that. So people think, oh, but people lost their jobs. Yeah, but many more jobs were created over here than were shut down over here. And better paying jobs. So finance does that. It reallocates capital constantly. They're looking. Uh, is this making money? Is this a good industry to be in? Is this, is this the future? You know, so a lot of capital went into crypto, sadly. Um, at least in certain companies in crypto. We'll see what happens in the end. Because people thought there were real opportunities there. And a lot of money is going out, and it's going to find the next. Right now, where's money flowing? Where's a lot of capital being invested right now? What's the hot, sexy thing right now as we speak? Not crypto. Artificial intelligence. Absolutely. AI. AI. Every venture capitalist in Silicon Valley wants an AI company right now. Everybody's putting money into AI. And that, you know, maybe they'll have some breakthroughs, maybe not, maybe there'll be overinvestment, maybe not, and the capital will flow elsewhere. But every one of these industries are created because capital flows into those industries. You have ideas, capital, management, that's what create companies. So I don't believe there's more important a industry, a business, for economic growth, for economic success, for entrepreneurship, for innovation, than financial markets, than finance. Now, that was a very brief history. I've got a book, uh, The Market Case for Finance, if you're interested. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Um, and uh, it kind of goes into a lot more detail. But those of you who are going to go into finance, or those of you interested in finance, I know there's a lot of shame and, and people look weirdly at you if you're in finance and people denounce financiers. But financiers should be proud of what they do. It's a crucial, crucial role in the economy. The economy would collapse without it. Innovation and progress would not exist without robust, healthy financial markets and the people doing the work in them. Thank you, and I'll take any questions you might have. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you once more again for your very energetic speech <laughs> and very motivational. So as you have mentioned, humanity went through the period where we had just less or about two dollars. Yep. But nowadays, completely different situation. We have nowadays so many chances and opportunities. But how to say it, leftist and Marxist ideas are still alive, and not only alive, but becomes more and more popular. What is the reason? Why do we have such situation from your perspective to discuss with the great? Thank you. Sure. So, so why is why are Marxist leftist ideas still so popular? And that's a big question. And I can give a three-hour lecture just on that easily, right? Easily three hours. But let me let me condense it. I think the two basic ideas that have to be turned upside down, that have to be challenged to challenge the Marxist and the leftist, and I don't think many people do them. One, unfortunately, most people. <laughs> I'm gonna be, I'm gonna try to be nice, but the reality is most people don't think. And economics is an abstract field. Most people just look and they see. So for example, if I buy an iPhone for $1,000, what most people see 
is I gave $1,000, I got an iPhone, and they interpret that as a zero-sum transaction. I gave up $1,000, got an iPhone, I didn't benefit, I gave, I gave up exactly what I received, and Apple, it's, it's kind of a zero-sum, and Apple seems to make a profit somehow, so it seems, where did that profit come from? How did Apple make a profit, and yet I gave up $1,000 and got an iPhone, exactly what I paid for. So it seems like Apple made money off of me. It seems like Apple could have sold me this $500. They would have broken even, and I'd break even, and then everybody's happy. That's what Ayn Rand called a perceptual level mentality. All they can do is see, they can't think. And unfortunately, most people treat economics that way. They view the world as a zero-sum game. If a billionaire makes a billion, he must have stolen it from someone. I mean, my mother, when I was growing up, told me, every millionaire is a thief. She was, a, she was a, you know, a, a, at some level, a, a, a socialist, not, you know, and, and she believed that. They, because it's zero sum. What happens with zero sum? If, if it's one pie, if somebody gets a big piece, somebody else gets a little piece. And what they don't understand is that it's a growing pie. That wealth is created. Now, how is wealth created when I buy an iPhone? One of the challenges we have as economists is we don't know how to measure the value the iPhone has to me. Because this iPhone, even though I paid $1,000 for it, or the reason I paid $1,000 for it, is because this is worth a lot more than $1,000 to me. Now, if you promise not to tell Apple, I'll tell you how much it's worth. It's tens of thousands of dollars. But don't tell them because that weighs the price just on me, knowing that it's worth so much, right? It's worth a fortune. And I could get, again, I could probably talk an hour just on my iPhone, but I'll give you a few examples, right? I can listen to every piece of music ever composed and recorded in all of human history on this thing at a marginal cost of zero. I buy a service and then I get all this music. I remember going to record stores and I'd have to buy, what, two million records at a hundred million dollars, right? It would cost me more money than I could ever imagine to ever have to buy all the records that I have right here on this little thing. And by the way, I can listen to it, not just in my home with that record player and have to clean the records and put the needle on. I can listen to this anywhere in the world while I'm flying, while I'm driving. Anyway, just from this little box. Is this worth $1,000 to me? This is worth like millions of dollars. And that's just one. I'm not even, you know, some of you are old enough to remember maps. Remember maps? Paper? And you would like have to drive like this and look at the map and look at the road and everybody would get into accident. It was terrible. Now I can go anywhere in the world, including Tbilisi, and drive myself anywhere and not get lost. Which is amazing. And the number of marriages this has saved is unbelievable because you always argued with your wife on who's right, right turn, left turn. Now Apple tells you and you don't have to argue anymore. And you could go on and on about the phone calls and the video calls and it, the value of this is unbelievable. You guys were born with this, I know, attached to your, to your pocket. So you don't appreciate it, but those of us who remember life without an iPhone know what it was like. Where's the value creation? In my life. My life is better. And I don't know how to measure that. And I, people don't know how to explain that. So people have this zero-sum mentality. Apple's making money and I'm losing. No, I'm gaining more than Apple. Every time an iPhone is sold, the person buying it is gaining more than the profit Apple gets. And that, so that's one. That's the easier one. The second one is, we live in a world where the moral code in the culture is that to be moral, to be good, you must give to others and not expect anything in return. Real nobility, real virtue, saints, help other people and don't expect anything in return. They suffer for other people, they'll die for other people, they'll give to other people, and if they don't do it because it makes them happy, they don't do it because it makes them feel good, they do it because that's what they're supposed to do. And that, we live in a culture, that is supposed to be morality. Why? Why should I give you anything without expecting anything in return? My life is my life. Why is your life more important than mine? To me. I, to you, your life is more important. But to me, my life is most important. And this is Rand's revolution, right? I mean, Rand tells us, no, 
Your life is the standard. Your, your happiness is what you should strive towards. So when you give somebody something, expect something in return. Absolutely. The way we should relate to one another is not sacrificer and so somebody receiving sacrifices. The way we should relate to one another is as traders. I give you something, I get something back. Whether it's monetary traders, as in capitalism, as in finance, I give you money, I give you, money you give me a product, or you pay me back with interest. Or spiritual trade. You know, well, I give you friendship and I get friendship back and, and we have this interaction between us where both of us are benefit. So the, 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 what we need to learn as a culture is the value of win-win relationships. The value of trade from a moral perspective, not just an economic perspective. We need to learn that value is created and that moral value is created. That this is noble and good to seek your own happiness, your own self-interest. Not as an exploiter, not as a user, but as a trader with other people. Value for value, so everybody wins. Win-win relationships. So we've got a moral revolution, and we need to teach people how to think about economic transactions. Those are the two things we need to do to change the world so that they have a different view. Yeah. Hello. Well, first of all, your speech was amazing and really interesting. And also, you mentioned that money change changed from time to time. Like we had gold, we had these papers, like red or something. I know that there was stones also. There was what? Uh, stones, like uh, stones. That's right. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. Do you think that money that we have today will change in the future and be like maybe crypto or something like that? So, do I think money today? Today, uh, where does money come from today? We, we print it. And who prints it? The government does. Government prints the money. And so at some point, the government figured out, governments all over the world figured out, that having banks issue money gives banks a lot of power and denies a lot of power over the economy to the governments themselves. So governments started creating central banks. Banks that the government owned. And then they started saying, okay, but that's not good enough because we want to we wanna have even more political power. So they uh, banned banks from issuing money. And they made the central bank a monopoly over the issuance of money. And originally that monopoly over the issue of money still needed to get gold in order to print new money because gold was still the standard. But then the government said, this limits how much we can... Siri always interferes in the middle of my talks. I don't know. She's, she, I think she's objecting to what I'm saying. She's like, stop it. Um, governments figured out, wait a minute. The fact that I'm limited in how much money I print by the amount of gold limits my power. Let's get rid of gold. And now I just print as much money as I want. And that's what we have today. Everywhere in the world, governments just print as much money as they want. If they print too much money, what happens? Inflation. We're seeing that now all over the world. Governments all over the world during COVID printed lots of money so that they could lock you at home and keep you happy. Because if they'd locked you at home and not giving you money, you would have been upset. So they locked you at home and then they printed money and handed it to you. But then the consequence is inflation. And then sometimes governments don't print money enough because they're central planners and they get stuff wrong. There's no competition. And when they don't print enough money, what happens then? Well, there's a lot of demand for the money and not enough of it. Interest rates go up and often the economy goes into recession. So I would argue, I think most economists in the room would argue, that governments printing money is not a good idea and will therefore not survive. Now, what will replace it? I don't know. Um, I believe in competition. So I believe that government should get out of the business of money and let the markets decide. Maybe it's Bitcoin. Maybe it's Ethereum. Maybe we go back to gold. Maybe it's digital gold, right? Gold with a digital currency backed by a deposit of gold. Maybe it's something nobody's thought of yet. That's the beauty of markets. The beauty of markets is that we don't know what the outcome is going to be. We have different 
systems competing with one another, and the one that's most efficient and most desirable by the people is the one that wins. So I am convinced that, I don't want to put a time frame, but at least, you know, maybe sooner, but in 100 years, we won't have the same monetary system we have today. Government will not be printing money because it's too disastrous, it's too costly, it's too bad for the economy. What exactly replaces it, we'll see. But it certainly could be some form of crypto, and it might be some form of crypto we haven't invented yet, right? I mean, everybody thinks Bitcoin is it, but Bitcoin is like 1.0 of crypto. You know, who knows what it's going to be in 50 years, how crypto is going to evolve the technology and our ability to use it. I mean, Bitcoin has real flaws and real problems as money. Maybe, maybe somebody will figure out how to fix them and create a different crypto that's even better. So I don't know. And, and usually when people ask me, well, if the government doesn't do it, how will the market solve it? I don't know. But the beauty of the market is it solves it, often in ways that none of us can predict. Did I predict the iPhone? No. Did I predict the internet? No, I'd be much richer than I am today if I predicted any of these things. So I don't make predictions about specific technologies. I just know that markets work because that is clearly proven. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, hi. Uh, it's always um, both experience and both motivation for uh, st school students to listen to professional people like you. Thank you. Um, and let's get back to my question. I have. Uh, I wonder if it's possible for countries to have isolated economical system for a while to say no to imported products and instead uh, support local businesses. How if it will work? Okay, so the question is, is, um, is having local, closed local economies possible and is it good in order to support local businesses and not by, by shielding them from competition from outside of the country? And I would say, I would say it's possible, but it's not good. <laughs> it's possible, but you're going to get poorer. Because the fact is that when you shield a country from imports, you're shielding the country from cheaper products. The reason the imports are coming in is because the products being made overseas are cheaper to buy than the local products. So A, the cost of living goes up. What happens when the cost of living goes up? Your standard of living goes down because you're spending more money on, on these goods and you have less money to save, you have less money to go to the movies, you have less money for other things. So first, you're making everything more expensive. Second, you're shielding your companies from competition. But we know that competition is good. What's good about competition? It spurs innovation. It spurs getting better at what you do. And now your local companies become lazy because there is no competition. So they produce bad products at higher and higher prices, again, your standard of living goes down. Um, and it denies you, as a consumer, the best opportunities, the best products, the best prices. Um, and if you, it, what happens if you pay less, let's say, let's say all your clothes are coming from China or Vietnam or India, or something like nobody in Georgia produces clothes, you buy all your clothes from there, and it's a lot cheaper. What happens to the difference? What happens to the money you save? What do you do with that money you save? What's that? Yeah, you might spend it on other things, some of which might be made in Georgia. You might not spend it. I'm, I've spent out. I've, I'm going to save it. And if you save it, what happens to that savings? It's invested in businesses in Georgia. So for Georgian businesses, what you want is you to buy what's cheaper elsewhere, and for Georgian businesses to specialize in the things that they're better than other places at. Uh, you know, every country, this is called comparative advantage. Every country needs to find, every businesses in every country need to find the things that they are good at doing, where they have a comparative advantage over people in the other country, where they can produce something cheaper. There's no difference in that sense between countries and individuals, right? It's like saying, for a while, I'm not gonna buy anything from anybody else, I'm just gonna make everything myself. Is that a good strategy? No, oh, it's terrible. 
So it's not good for you as an individual, it can't be good for the country either. I mean, in general, if you think about comparing policies for the country and policies for the individual, when it's not good for the individual, it's not going to be good for the country either. Uh, so, no, I would say never. The only good strategy for trade, and I think this is true of every country, is zero tariffs. And I would say unilaterally. Um, so tariffs, trade restrictions, import restrictions, all of those, throw them out. One of the great achievements in Georgia is you have a relatively open economy. You have relatively open free trade with other parts of the world. And that's one of the strengths of the Georgian economy. Any kind of trade barriers are always going to produce negative results. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for the amazing uh, speech. And uh, my question is, uh, what is the main reason for the country's economic crisis? And uh, if inflation destroys the country's economy, how did we get uh, through from uh, post-COVID situation? Thank how do you how do you do what? I didn't get the end. Oh, um, so you said that printing um, a lot of money is a uh, reason of inflation. Yeah. And uh, during COVID, do we uh, did uh, like printing money? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, after that, uh, I think um, inflation must be everywhere, right? Yeah. And how did we get through from that situation? So how do we how do we move forward? Yeah. Uh, what was the first part of the question? I'm getting old. Um, first part, quickly, just give me a word. Uh, what is the main reason for the country's economic crisis? Yeah, so the economic crisis is caused, almost all economic crises, are caused basically by two factors. Um, one is inflation. Now, what does inflation actually do? Not only does it raise your cost of living, and it, it raises your costs, and if your wages don't keep up with inflation, your cost of living and your standard of living therefore goes down, you have less money to spend, so you spend less of it, you buy the things you have to buy, those prices keep going up and you stop buying the things you don't have to buy, those businesses go down, and that starts creating a crisis. So that's one big cause, is bad management of money, which the government is at fault. I'd say the second big cause is government regulation of business. Government restricting what businesses can and cannot do, restricting their flexibility to adapt and adjust. Uh, making it difficult to open new businesses, for entrepreneurs to start out. Making it difficult for capitalists, for, for financial markets, to funnel money into the areas the way it's most needed. Uh, banks are the most regulated industry we have in pretty much every country uh, in the, on the planet. That restricts the flow of the blood. It's like having cholesterol. It's like having uh, uh, blocks in your arteries that don't allow the blood to get to where it's most needed. So if you want to solve economic crises, one is you have to find a better monetary system. I think the government getting out of it is the solution, but that's long term. In the short run, you have to stop government running deficits so that they don't have an incentive to print more money. You have to stop government running, running uh, deficits, and you have to stop governments uh, manipulating the interest rates. And then you have to deregulate. You have to get the government to lower and, and, and eliminate regulations. And the more regulations you eliminate, the more vibrant the business community is and more economic activity uh, you know, is created. So right now, to get out of this crisis, what we need, you know, the inflation, unless the government continue to print money, is probably peaked. But what now we need is more economic activity. So what now I would emphasize is cut government spending and reduce regulations dramatically. And the more regulations you reduce, the greater the economy, the economy grows. And it just assumes that we have a rule of law, which I think you do have in Georgia. You have a rule of law, now you just need to get the government out of the way and let entrepreneurs uh, power the economy forward. Hello. Hi, stand up. <laughs> there you go. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. So, uh, what do you think about the future of money? Um, because cryptocurrencies are more valuable now. Should I say that? I don't know. But um, my question is, will the cryptocurrencies pay uh, money like we, uh, bank that we call money? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Sure. 
So I, cryptocurrencies are not worth more than money. I mean, cryptocurrency is actually a, a, a fraction, a tiny fraction of the money in the world, right? So there are many more dollars than there are the value of crypto. Crypto is about a trillion dollars, maybe less than a trillion dollars. I can't remember how many dollars are circulating in the world, but many, 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 many times one trillion dollars, a lot more than that. Um, look, um, I think I think the crypto that ultimately replaces money has not been invented yet. That's my view. I don't think it's Bitcoin. I don't think it's any of the crypto we have today. I think this is still a young industry that needs to develop. I think the other aspect of this is that you always have to remember is that governments don't want to lose control. Will they let crypto become money? Because at the end of the day, what do we use money for? To buy stuff. Now imagine if the government said, no business is allowed to sell you stuff for crypto. Then crypto is worthless. You can't use it to buy stuff. And I think governments are going to do that. I think governments are going to hold on to their monopoly over money for as long as they can. And they will use all the means necessary to do it. Right now in the United States, since December, there's been a campaign by the, by, the, uh, United, by the U.S. regulators to try to kill crypto or crypto businesses. They've made it impossible for crypto companies to bank. They've made, they haven't given bank charters to, to crypto uh, entities. They're really making an effort to shrink the universe of crypto. Um, and I think they're just beginning. I think, these, I think governments are pretty nasty when it comes to this thing. You're, you're challenging their control. You're challenging their monopoly, and they're going to fight. And they have big weapons when they fight, right? What, what, what kind of weapons do the government have that we don't? They have big guns. They have the law, which is the biggest gun of all, right? Because what happens when you violate the law? You get punished. Whether you like it or not, somebody shows up and takes you to prison. Uh, they have a big gun. So I think, I think things are going to be very, very challenging for crypto. Um, I, you know, because I think governments will fight for this power that they have over money very, very viciously because I don't think they want to give it up, which is sad, but sad, but realistic. Do we have another question? Go ahead. Oh, and we have one here as well. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for an amazing speech. And the question I have for you is, how does money affect finance and how does what money? Black money. What do you mean by black money? Illegal money. Illegal money, okay. Affect finance and? And cost domestic products. And the cost of products. Gross domestic product, GBT. Oh, gross domestic product, okay. Um, look, uh, black markets always exist. Black markets always exist when you ban things. When you make things illegal that people want, you get a black market. So for example, in, in America in the 1920s, they banned alcohol. But everybody wants to drink alcohol, almost everybody. So what happened? Alcohol went into a black market and uh, violence associated with it because what happens when something's illegal? Risk goes up. Value goes up, prices go up. All, prices of alcohol go up when it's illegal because it's very difficult to smuggle it and to have a, the speakeasy where you can drink it in secret. All of that is expensive. So costs go up, the profits go way up, and who gets into the business because they have guns? The mafia, the bad guys. So black markets always exist when you ban a product. And violence always increases when you ban a product. So having black markets is very detrimental to an economy. You don't capture it in GDP. Cost of the good goes up. Violence increases. The mafia gets created. In America, the mafia was created during prohibition. There's nothing positive about it. So what do you do? How do you get rid of black markets? But some governments make it as their advantage, right? Some governments, government yeah, their use it as an advantage because they want you, first of all, they want to control you. They want to tell you what you can and cannot use and what you can and cannot consume. They want to tell you how you can consume it and so on. 
But they also, they like to pit people against each other. So they use it to control you. But how do we get rid of black markets? What's the only way, the only way to get rid of black markets? Is to whiten them, which means legalize them, make it legal. So for example, what's the biggest black market in the world right now? Drugs, right? Illegal drugs, heroin, cocaine, stuff like that. What's the consequence of having an illegal market in cocaine and, and heroin? Prices are very high. Profit margins, very high. Very risky, too. So what happens? Lots of violence. Thousands of people, maybe tens of thousands of people are killed every year because of the drug trade, because of drug-related violence. Do people still use drugs? Oh, yeah. Lots of them, particularly in America. Lots of drugs. But it costs them a lot, and people get killed, and they overdose. Why do they overdose? Why do so many people in America die from, from cocaine overdose? Because the quality is bad, and they can't measure the quality? No, because they want to avoid contact with police or something. Well, but also, there's no quality. When I go buy something at the drugstore, I know that there's a quality on it, right? There's some kind of quality control. There's liability. Uh, I could sue the company if they, if, they, if they do something bad to me. There's competition, so I could choose another product. But with drugs, I buy what's on the street. And I can't choose, and I can't complain. Who am I going to sue? The, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the gangs in Mexico? I mean, there's nobody to sue. So how do we get rid of the black market in drugs? I know it's hard to imagine, but you legalize them. If you make drugs legal, I don't think a lot more people will use, but the cost of using will go down. Violence will be eliminated. And more treatments will be available for those people who do use, because there'll be a market for those treatments. Basically, pretty much everybody wins, except the politicians who use the war on drugs to control us. And also, the people who want to tell us how to live. There are people out there who think you don't know how to make choices for yourself. God, if I made drugs legal, all of you would become heroin addicts. So I'm going to prevent you. I'm going to be a good person and prevent you from becoming drug addicts by not allowing you to have drug, heroin or whatever, right? But that, they think we're children. They think we can't think for ourselves. I read some research that said that uh, when they legalize the drugs or some kind of, for example, marijuana, uh, the using of it in um, country was less than it was before. Yeah, it first goes up and then it comes down. Because it first goes up because we want to experiment. We want to see what it was like, the secret, this, and then we experiment, and then, yeah, not a big deal, and we, and, and we give it up. So Portugal has basically legalized drugs, and uh, drug use has come down, and it's no big deal in Portugal, one way or the other. And it's not like everybody's addicted. So there are ways to get rid of black markets. And the way to get rid of black markets is get government out of the way. Legalize it. But it is harmful to the economy and harmful to having black markets is harmful to everybody. But there are big examples of addiction. If you remember China opium wars, for example, there was like lots of trade of drugs. Yeah, but there wasn't, there wasn't really free trade during the opium wars in, uh, in China. China was not a free country, and uh, the drugs were being used to manipulate people, and the drugs were being pushed, uh, were being pushed on those people. So I don't, I don't consider what happened during the opium wars an example of legal. I consider that part of, the, part of this, um, you know, governments kind of controlling this and using it to control their people by getting them addicted. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yes. Hello, um, thank you for your speech. Um, my question is, if we contact uh, economic to the international relations, there is basically two theories. One, one of them is economic authorities, and the other one is economic nationalists. And um, liberalism says that when two countries integrate with each other, there is never a zero-sum game. Um, both of them gain something, there's always profit. Uh, but economic nationalism says, says that there is always uh, one winner and the other one loses. Yeah. So, um, uh, so there is zero something. something. Yep. So which one do you think is more relevant? And I want to know your opinion. Yeah, so... Um, Thank you. Sure. 
So there's no question. I mean, this, uh, this question was answered 250 years ago by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. Um, economic liberalism is true and economic nationalism is false. Economic nationalism is mercantilism. And mercantilism is false for the same reason. There's no, look, I, I, let me step back one second and say that all of international relations, most of international relations, is just wrong. And even the framing of the question is wrong. Because the reality is that countries don't trade with one another. Georgians don't trade with, who do you trade with? Armenians. Georgia doesn't trade with Armenia. Who trades with who? People. People. Individuals. A Georgian person buys something from Armenia. And it happens to cross a border. Who cares? Two people just exchange goods. When two people exchange goods, is it win-win or lose-lose? Or lose-win? It's win-win. It doesn't matter that the person is right in front of me in the same country, or across the border, or across the other side of the planet. I buy stuff, um, I buy stuff from Germans. America doesn't buy anything from Germany. Iran goes into his local store and buys something made in Germany. That store has bought it from somebody in Germany who has then bought it from a supplier. I traded with some guy in Germany. All trade is between individuals or between companies, but, but at the end, all companies are owned by individuals. All trade is between individuals. Countries don't trade. So there's no such thing as a trade deficit. You know what? Whether, you know who has a, a huge trade deficit? You do. Every single one of you has a massive trade deficit with your grocery store. You know the grocery store? You go in, you buy, you buy groceries, and you buy, um, it, I don't know, uh, uh, cleaning materials, and you buy paper towels at the grocery store, right? And you give them money, and you get all the groceries. That's a massive trade deficit. Has a grocery store ever asked you to do work for them? No. I, I, I have a huge trade deficit with the grocery store. Grocery store has never asked me to come and give a lecture. So what did I have a, a, grocery, a, a trade deficit? That's the whole point of money. The whole point of money is that I can buy whatever I want from whoever I want, and it's fungible. It moves about. So countries don't really have trade deficits. Individuals do, and it doesn't matter one way or another. So the whole conception of economic nationalism is wrong, and it was wrong 250 years ago, and it's doubly wrong today because... It's discussed, What's that? It's still discussed. Oh, no, it's not just discussed. Politicians believe it. People believe it. And indeed, we are moving into an era right now of more and more economic nationalism, but it's wrong, thoroughly wrong, absolutely wrong. It's one of the one thing in economics that almost all economists believe, agree on, even people on the left and on the right, Free trade is so obviously true, works, that almost everybody agrees about it, but then it's politicized. Yeah, that's it it's, politi it's politicized, and it takes into account the fact that most people are ignorant, sadly, and don't think. But, but economic, I don't know who still teaches economic nationalism, but it's not an economist, almost certainly not an economist. I mean, even, I don't know if you know who Paul Krugman is. Do you know who Paul Krugman is? He's a very left-wing economist in the United States. He got his Nobel Prize for free trade thing, even though he's a leftist. Even he is an advocate of free trade, at least used to be before he became political. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think this is the last question, because people want to eat. I don't know. I'm not hungry. You guys, I, I can go all night, so don't test me. Yeah. So at first, thank you for your amazing, extraordinary speech. Uh, as long as I know, uh, Georgia has one of the best index of economical freedom in Europe. So my question is how uh, we, the younger generation, could use this economical freedom for our own good? Well, I mean, uh, you're going to use economic freedom for your own good first by living it, right? By, by, by the very fact that you live in a country that is relatively free, you have more employment opportunities, you have more entrepreneurial opportunities, you have more wealth creating opportunities, more investment opportunities. So take advantage of the fact, uh, you know, many of you might become entrepreneurs. 
this is a pretty good place to become an entrepreneur because you're going to face less regulations than a lot of other places around the world. Um, the other thing I think that's really important for the younger generation to do is to fight for this freedom and liberty. The economic freedom you have in Georgia today is to a large extent a product of Pata's generation, right? That fought in the, you know, in the 2000s, uh, 20 years ago, for real liberalizing the, the Georgian economy. And to a large extent, that has slowly, you've drifted away a little bit from that. Georgia was more economically free to some extent 20 years ago than it is today. You need to embrace the mantle of economic freedom and economic liberalism, demand from your politician to continue this trend towards more and more liberalization, more and more freedom. Uh, you're, I think you're number 20-something in the world on the Economic Freedom Index. Am I right? 20-something? No, uh, last time I think you were 60 or something like that. Oh, you're way down 60. Yeah, because of the COVID. Was, uh, oh, during COVID. So you should be, why can't you be number one? Yeah, we will return to 10, I believe. What's that? We will return to the 10. Yeah, so let's, let's say you're somewhere there. Why can't you be number one? Right? A, a goal should be to be at the top of the economic freedom index, to be the most free country in the world. There's no reason it can't be Georgia. It happens to be Singapore right now, but that doesn't mean anything. You can, why can't you do better than Singapore? So there's nothing inherent in Singapore that suggests it has to be that. I would like to see countries compete on who can be the freest. And what happens when you have freedom is you have more opportunities. What happens when you have freedom is you can do a lot more with your life. You can do a lot. You have more opportunities, both as a consumer, a producer, an employee, an entrepreneur. And that's what you want. You want to maximize the opportunities that you have in life. And that's what economic freedom gives you. So fight for it. You know, uh, too many people in the young generation take the world for granted. Whatever world they're given, that's what the world they get. No, you get to shape your world. When Pada was young, he fought for, for the liberty you're enjoying today. You need to continue fighting it. We always need to continue. Liberty and freedom are things that are very slippery. They go away very quickly. If we don't constantly fight for them, we are not constantly vigilant for them, we will lose them. So I encourage everybody here who's young and old, you know, whatever you are, or in, in between as well, uh, to fight for freedom, fight for liberty. You're fighting for your own life, your own values, your own prosperity, and you're fighting for your kids, and you're fighting for everybody by doing so. So don't just accept the world as it is. Okay, Jonathan is, is, wants me to remind you of a couple of things. You can get a free Ayn Rand book by scanning that one card, and you can download a free Ayn Rand book. I encourage everybody to do it. You get to choose which book, and you can download it. Free book. How can you say no to a free book and potentially life-changing, right? Uh, Jonathan's life was changed by Atlas Shrugged. My life was changed by Atlas Shrugged. I read it when I was younger than most of you, when I was 16, and it blew my mind away, completely turned my life upside down. Second, you can still apply for a scholarship to this amazing conference we have in um, Greece in beginning of April. It's in Athens. What better place? to be in Athens, amazing place. You get lectures and courses and tours, and you get it all for free, including your flight there and your hotel there. But you have to apply. You have to write a little essay about why you want it and everything, and not everybody's gonna get it, but you should apply because you might get it. And you spend a weekend in Greece. Life is rough, I know. Um, and then finally, if you're already into Ayn Rand's books, and you've already read some Ayn books, and you'd like to participate in a reading group, with other people and kind of go over essays and have discussions and debates, there's another card over there where you can scan the code and you can, uh, and you can join one of those reading groups that we're putting together right now. Thank you, really, really appreciate it, really enjoyed this. <laughs>